A friend of mine, he, uh, he says, sermonettes produce Christianettes. And, uh, and I think that's a, a brilliant phrase, and I've kind of adopted that when it comes to, to how I teach. Uh, the idea being that if what is being taught week after week is light and fluffy, then the Christian you get at the end of the day will be light and fluffy. Uh, and that might be good for stuffed animals, but you want to have something a bit more significant, something with a bit more depth to it, especially when the waves of life begin to, to come against it. That doesn't mean that each of the sermons need to be super highbrow and university level and use $10 words all the time, uh, because then the gospel would only be meant for the intellectual crowd. And, and quite frankly, looking around the room, I got a live one. This will be fun. All right. I could have some fun with this, so. Uh, it doesn't mean you shy away from those difficult topics. It just means that it's not simply week after week that the basic ABCs of, of the faith, but we're willing to sometimes dive into some of the more nuanced, some of the deeper aspects of our faith. And that's what we're going to do this morning is we're going to, we're going to try to uh, tackle a theological subject that has been debated within the church for over 500 years. Good luck. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I, I think if they just listened to me, we'd all agree. So, I tried that line at home. It doesn't work either. So, but, um, but anyways, at the start of the 16th century, there was really the, the universal church or the Catholic church, uh, had already embraced this idea of selling indulgences. And what an indulgence was, was this idea that it didn't matter how you lived and what sins you committed. You could essentially buy the forgiveness by donating some money to the church. And that would guarantee your, your pathway into heaven. And so you can kind of purchase your salvation if you were rich enough. And, and so those kinds of abuses were happening within the church. And so on October 31st in uh, 1517, a monk named Martin Luther, who was angry and disgusted by the corruption and, and by the selling of the indulgences and really by defaming the gospel, he, uh, he famously nailed these 95 theses or 95 statements uh, of his accusation or charges against the church. And some of them were sarcastic and funny and others were a bit more serious. Um, but that moment, many historians now would recognize is what let, lit the reformation of the church. It wasn't the, the first thing that happened. There were other things going on and other people aside from Martin Luther, but that was sort of that moment that kind of crystallized so much action within the church. And that ultimately led to a split from the church to what formed the Protestant group or the, the Protestant uh, Association of Churches, which today is comprised of many different churches, whether it be Reformed or Baptist or Presbyterian or Pentecostal or evan- Evangelical and so forth. <clears throat> but the, the divide and the schism that led to the Reformation was much more than just about the corruption. It was much more than just the selling of indulgences. There was, there was something bigger than that. Um, the most significant issue around that was on what basis does someone get to call themselves a Christian? What's required for someone to be saved? And is it based solely on a statement of faith? Is it, is it basically that they recited a prayer, a sinner's prayer, and that's enough? Or do they have to do certain things? Are there certain aspects of their life that are required? Uh, a quote-unquote works portion to it. And, and so this debate's been raging on for 500 years plus, and it will continue likely until Jesus comes. But it is important. It is significant because it is at the core of our faith, the basis of our faith. And so it's important that we do spend some time uh, discussing it. And, and I say that because what you and I believe about salvation is going to influence what we believe about God and our relationship with God. And so if you've got bad theology, that's going to have a negative impact on your relationship with God and how you live. For example, if you believe that it is an accurate statement for a Christian to say that I am a forgiven sinner, then you will live like a forgiven sinner. And think about it. What do sinners do? They will sin, and that's how they will live. But nowhere in Scripture does God call you a forgiven sinner. Nowhere in Scripture does he say that you are a sinner saved by grace. I said that once to a theologian, and he sat there for about a couple minutes, and I could see him going through his mental concordance. Well, no, 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 no. It's not there. Nowhere does God call us that. You know what he does call us 63 plus times? Saints, holy ones, righteous, 
new creations. That's who we are. And so that's what we need to understand who we are, because if we can believe that we're now saints with a pure heart, with a, with a, a new creation, a new spirit joined to his spirit, then we can live that way. And so we live in a manner worthy of our calling. So we want to we want to explore this theological debate, but we we don't want to only be about knowledge because knowledge will simply puff up. So we want to go beyond that. We want to we want to understand things, but we also want to live according to what we know, right? We want to not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word, as James puts it. And so as we understand some of these these different theological aspects, we're also going to see how that's going to impact how we live and how we walk. So you can turn to Genesis chapter 22. We're in there for one more week. And and then um, I'm going to pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you and we love you for the incredible truth that because of what you've done and who we are in you, we are new creations. And we get to now live in in union with you. We get to walk with you and we get to trust you. And so I, I pray this morning, Lord, that you would be the teacher right now, that, that your words would come to my mind. And more importantly, even that you would, you would take your truth and allow us to understand it so that we could experience life in you in a greater way. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so we've been in chapter 22 for a little while in Genesis, and that's that, that crucial point in Abraham's life where he has been tested by God, right? Where God has, has asked him to sacrifice his son, his only son, the son whom he loves, Isaac, on an altar. And we've already recognized that it's not that God wanted him to do that. He had no intention of sacrificing Isaac. It was a test for Abraham. It was a test to see for Abraham, does he want God or does he want God for something else? Is Isaac his real, real God or something else is real God? So that was a test that was going to be challenged to him. Am I going in and out here too? This is fun. All right. So, and if you're choosing well, am I out? I'm, all right, I'll keep going. I apologize for those who are watching online. It's better than last week, though, when we're all garbly. So, answer to. All right, going old school here, and I will probably trip. Okay, so so he passes the test in Genesis chapter twenty-two, and and now what I want to read to you, beginning of verse fifteen of twenty-two. Uh, what God next says to him, right? So the angel of the Lord, that's God, called Abraham a second time from heaven. And he said, by myself, I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed, I will greatly bless you. And I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand, which is of the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of your, their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because... You have obeyed my voice. Well, when I was studying that passage, I had, I had some questions with it. That's why we're back in this one more time, because my struggle with it was in 22, God is saying, because you've obeyed, now I'm going to bless you. And my struggle with that was, but God, did you not already say that you're going to bless? Him? So why? Why, what did it mean when you said it earlier? Because if you kind of compare what he says here in 22, you see a lot of similarity to what he promised in 12. So in Genesis 12, he says, uh, when he called Abram at the beginning, he says, I will bless you. I will make your name great. That from you, all the nations of the world will be blessed, referring to Jesus. And we see that in 22. In 13, he said the same thing about how his descendants would be like the sand of the seashore. And we see that in 22. In 15, he promised him that his descendants will be like the stars of the sky. And we see that in 22. And then in 17, he promised them the land. And we see that here in 22 as well. So my, my struggle was, well, what were you promising? What were you saying in 12, 13, 15, and 17 that now somehow comes to fruition here in 22? Were those, were those promises in those earlier chapters or were they not? And what we're going to see here, I hope this morning, is that the Christian life is much more than just a single moment of salvation. 
right? Salvation is not the, not the be all and end all of all things. It's really just the beginning. It's the introduction. And there's a life now to be lived out, a life to be experienced. And I think that's why so many people appreciated that famous book, Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. Because what it did is it laid out a journey that was much more than just get saved. It's not get saved and everything's fine. There was so much more that needed to take place and happen. And that's going to be the case here, I think, is what we're going to see in here in 22. So how do we understand the, the, the apparent conflict here? That God promised this blessing and it was by grace, but now it's because of your obedience that you're going to get blessed. And fortunately, the best commentary on the Bible is what? The Bible itself. And so this passage in particular has been quoted by some of the New Testament writers, two in particular that we want to look at, one by Paul and one by James. So the first one we're going to look at is Paul. That's, these are the two most relevant passages. And the first one is in Romans chapter 4. So if you want to turn to Romans 4, beginning in verse 1. And so here, Paul, in, in, in the book of Romans, he's laying out the means of salvation, how we're saved. And so in verse 1, he says, What shall we say then that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he is something to boast about. Right? So Paul's addressing people who have had this mindset that if they obey the law, if they follow all the rules, that's going to be their justification. And remember, justification is a word that refers to their acceptance, their approval. In other words, we could use for justification would be, would be complete and blameless. And so Paul's argument, did, did Abraham become blameless because of his works? For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. That's referring to Genesis chapter 15 where he just put his faith, he put his trust in, in God, and it was credited, imputed, he was now declared blameless and righteous. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. So what is Paul saying? That he's, you're basically, you are made righteous, you are justified, you are saved by faith alone. Pretty clear, right? Well, the second passage I want you to turn to is James chapter 2, beginning verse 21. And James now is going to also refer to Abraham and, and what happened with him. And so he says, beginning verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God and was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Anyone see any problems with that? Seems to be contradictory. Seems to have an issue here, right? And, and, and Abraham, he's referring to the sacrifice or the, the willingness to sacrifice in chapter 22 of Genesis as the evidence of that works, and then he quotes the same passage that Paul quoted in Genesis 15 about that righteous being credited to Abraham, but making it clear that faith alone is not enough. So what do we do here? How do we, how do we handle this? Well, apparently based on church history, what we do is we highlight one verse and we ignore the other and we argue and we fight. That seems to be the case, uh, because that's essentially what I think is happening. And, and so there are really two major kind of conclusions that happen. And I'm going to call one of them the Catholic view and one of them the Protestant view. And that's just a generic term we're going to use. Not every Catholic believes this and not every Protestant believes the Protestant view. But generally speaking, the Catholics hold one position and the Protestants hold a position. So we're going to kind of use those terms as kind of labels and try to understand them a bit more. And so let's start with the Catholic view, right? So in the Catholic view, they nod to Paul. They recognize the verse because you can't ignore the verse. So they have an, an acknowledgement that Paul says that you're saved by grace through faith alone. And they, re they recognize that. And they would say, yes, you're justified by grace. No problem with that. And again, justification in their mind is salvation. But I think they have an issue with fully understanding what that means because they go on and argue that what James is saying in chapter two of his letter is that the justification there is in addition to the justification you get at salvation. So you're saved, you're justified by grace at salvation, and then based on your works, you can add to that justification. 
think about that for a moment. Does that actually make sense with the meaning of the word justification? You're blameless at salvation, but if you work harder, you can become more blameless. You're perfect at salvation, but if you work a little bit better, you could be more perfect. You're complete in Christ at salvation, but Norm, if you just buckle down, you could become more complete. How do you become more complete? Right? And so, so that's sort of the, the problem they're having here. And so that's one element of it. But they also have another element of this because as the Reformation was taking place and the Protestant church was starting to form their understanding and their beliefs about faith and salvation and grace and so forth, the Catholic church had their own kind of get together. They called it the Council of Trent. And it took place over, over uh, two or three decades. And they came to certain conclusions about this. And that's where they came to the idea that, yes, you're saved by grace, but you become more saved by your works. And they also came to the conclusion, though, that therefore, if your works are not good, you can lose that grace. Meaning if you commit any what they call moral sins, and any moral sin was anything, if you broke the Ten Commandments in any way, or, or if you committed a sin that would, the, the Bible would talk about vengeance of God would be on you, then that's a mortal sin, and you would lose grace, even if you didn't lose your faith. So think about that. You may still have faith in God, but because of your mortal sin, you've lost grace and therefore lost your salvation. Hence the reason in the Catholic view that if you commit suicide, you've lost your salvation because you've committed a mortal sin and haven't had time to repent of it. And so that's sort of their thinking of that. And so you're fully justified by grace alone through faith, but you're made perfect and complete by your obedience to the law. I'm not sure that makes sense. I'm not sure how you can reconcile those things, especially the idea that your, your ability to maintain grace a gift you did not earn is based on your performance and your ability to, to work for it. Now, to be honest, though, there are arguments not without merit, right? They, they are talking about the importance of faith enduring to the end. And scripture has a lot of verses that refer to that. And they're also acknowledging James chapter two, where it talks about the importance of faith plus works. So they're not entirely wrong. Well, does that mean the Protestant view is the correct one? Well, again, they have justified by grace alone through faith alone. That was very important. They, they had these five solas in the initial reformation and one of them being soul of faith, right? It's only by faith, only by God's grace that we're saved. And so they would also though nod to James and agree that works matter, but then they largely dismiss James and just kind of focus on Paul is basically how they go about it. And so the idea here, this is where we come up with the sinner's prayer. The idea that now all you need to do is you need to just pray this prayer, confess certain things that you're a sinner and that you repent and you want Jesus to be your savior and come live in you. And that's it. You've checked the box and you're saved. It doesn't matter from here on out. You are now saved because you have confessed that faith in Jesus Christ. And again, their view has merit, right? Romans 5.21, where sin abounds, God's grace super abounds all the more. Right, You cannot out the grace of God. And so the Protestant view is recognizing that, that it doesn't matter what your life looks like after salvation because God's grace is always there. Or Ephesians 2, 8, 9, right? By grace, we've been saved through faith apart from works, not by works so that no one may boast. And so they've got that aspect of it. And then even in Romans 3, 28, for Paul says, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So they have a lot of verses that kind of back that up. But again, what do you do with James chapter two? They haven't been able to figure that part out. And so what ends up happening is the Protestants kind of adopted a viewpoint that's actually very similar to the Catholic view. They just use a slightly different word. So remember the Catholics said that the justification that James is talking about is after salvation where you can improve upon and increase your level of justification based on your obedience to the law. Well, the Protestants... They would say, yes, you're justified at salvation, but after salvation, you can improve your sanctification. They introduce a new word, and how does one introduce your sanctification? By your works in obedience to the law. So in reality, they're kind of landing at the same spot, fighting over two different words, but I don't think either is correct. Because if it was possible for you to improve your sanctification or improve your justification or your righteousness based on what you did, then 
we don't have the need for Jesus today. Maybe for salvation, but after that, it's all up to you. And, and now, Chuck, you just got to buckle down and work harder. But you know who's in charge of your sanctification? Jesus is, right? He's the one that's in charge of it. And sanctification really is just maturity. It's not about adding something. It's not about becoming better. It's about growing up. So how do we, how do we understand then what, what Paul and James are arguing for? Because they are arguing the same thing, but I don't think it's about obedience to the law after salvation. That's not what it's about. So let's start by understanding the nature of faith, right? Because the, the most important aspect of our faith is in what or in whom do you place your trust? That's, that's really the, the crux of faith. And, and everybody who has breath in their lungs has faith. Right? And I say that because a lot of people say, oh, I don't have enough faith for this, or I don't have any faith. No, no, we all have faith. Right? The Muslims have faith in their ability to follow the, the five pillars of Islam and, and measure up to Allah. The Jews have faith that the following the Ten Commandments and the, the teachings of all the rabbis and the Talmud, that will be their salvation. Even the atheists have faith. They have faith that there is no God or that science is, is their God or maybe even more accurately that they are their own God. That's the faith that they have. And, and so we all have faith. The question is where you put that faith. And therefore, it's not even the size of your faith that matters. Right? That's why Jesus says all you need is the faith the size of a mustard seed. This is a small, one of the smallest seeds. And so if you have enough faith in a mustard seed, to become a mustard, seed, a mustard tree or plant, whatever that is, then that's it. That's, that's all. That, that's the amount of faith you need. It all depends on what that, ob, that object of faith is. For example, I could have all the faith in the world that the Toronto Maple Leafs will win the Stanley Cup this year. Incredible faith. And I could bet all of my money. Better yet, I could bet all of Willem's money, right? And so I can have all the faith and bet all this money. And you know what's going to happen? Willem and I are going to be moving in with Mike, right? So it doesn't matter if your faith is misplaced. And so as Christians, as believers, our faith is not in a set of doctrines, right? Think about it. When you show up in heaven at the pearly gates, is Peter going to hand you an exam and say, now listen, before you can come in, we got to make sure that you can check off certain things and answer the test properly. That's not what our faith is. It's not in a set of doctrines. Our faith is in what? A person. The person of Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. And so that's what we needed. We needed a Savior, not a teacher. And I say that because today, a lot of people, they put their faith in teachings. Whether it be a pastor, or maybe it be an author, or nowadays, even they put their faith in podcasters like Andrew Huberman or Jordan Peterson or, or all kinds of other people out there, or, or maybe Tony Robbins with his big smile. And they put their faith in those teachings. And if I could just follow the teachings, that will be my success. But remember, Jesus is our savior. That's what we need. We needed a savior more than we needed a teacher. And so that person of Jesus Christ is the savior. And that truth needs to see it sink deep within our souls because that what he has done has restored that connection, that trust, that ability to connect with God. So put it another way, when someone places their faith in Jesus, what they've done is they've announced that they're team Yahweh, they're team God, because Jesus is the only pathway to Yahweh, only pathway to God. He says that in John 14, 6. And in recognizing Jesus Christ as the son of God and declaring that allegiance to Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one who sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that's our redemption. But quite frankly, confessing or declaring this is not enough. It's just, if they're just empty words, it's insufficient. And I, and I know that that's not going to be very comforting to some people especially people who have loved ones, maybe children or family members, and, and they're, they're not currently walking with God, but they'll say, but it's okay because when they were five or six years old, they raised the hand and they prayed the prayer. And I'm sorry to be the one to tell you, but that doesn't mean anything. Maybe, 
Maybe something did transact and something did change in their heart, but holding on to a prayer that they prayed 20, 30, 40 years ago isn't enough. Because maybe that prayer was just empty words. Maybe that's all it was. See, faith, for it to be real, it will be enduring. It's not just a one-time act that's discarded. Think about it. That's sort of like showing up at a wedding, saying I do, and then walking out and just never turning back. Just, just leaving the spouse at the altar. I said I do. I'm married. Well, are you? Even legally, we wouldn't recognize that as a marriage because that marriage hasn't been consummated. It's not a real marriage. So just saying I do isn't enough. There has to be something deeper transacted within the heart. And essentially, this is what James's point is getting at. So let's see if we can reconcile these two seemingly contradictory statements because they're not actually contradictory. They really are trying to say the same thing, but they are highlighting certain things differently to different audiences. So in Paul's case, where he's very clear, you and I were saved by grace apart from works, apart from the law. No man could be justified under the law. That is as clear as it gets. What he is primarily addressing is a group of people who are very religious, who are believing and putting their faith in their performance, putting their faith in their accomplishments. They're putting their faith in their obedience. And they think that somehow their performance or their standard performance is going to be the, the way in which they are either saved or maintain that salvation, maintain that justification before God. In essence, Paul is rebuking the belief of many Christian leaders today. He really is. He's rebuking that idea that, that your sanctification, your, your level of justification is in any way attached to your obedience to the law. He's making that distinction very clear. At the same time, again, though, offering up a prayer one day because you were told to as a child or you had an emotional response at a, at a crusade of some sort isn't enough. Because as James is saying, true faith will include action. Right? True faith is belief plus action. It's the, it's the outcoming of all that. And so James' audience is a group of people who are, are sort of treating God as if they have a friends with benefits kind of relationship. That, that basically they, they have all the benefits without the commitment to Christ. And they're not really looking to have any kind of uh, ongoing obedience or connection to him. They're just wanting to get what they can get out of it. So they can get the blessing without the submission. And that's evidenced, James is saying, by their lack of love, by their lack of mercy that they're, they're not showing to one another. So in other words, they're selfishly looking at what God can do for them, making God their servant rather than serving God. They're out for their own personal benefit. And both James and Paul are calling that no faith at all. Many other writers in the New Testament would argue as well, that is not faith. You see, the teaching of all the apostles is that what, when, when you and I, when we have faith in Jesus Christ, that brings transformative change inside you're crucified with Christ. It's not as if you're crucified with Christ. It's not like you're crucified with Christ. You are that old spirit, that sinner was included in Jesus Christ on that cross, was crucified, it was buried, and it is gone forever. Where's that amen? You come up to the front here and you be louder. I'm kidding. But that, that is so important because you're not just washed clean and sent back out there. Because that would be like having a pig that's all dirty and you give the pig a bath and you send it back out in the field and guess what it's going to do? It's going to get dirty again because the pig is a pig. No, God didn't just wash the sinner. He crucified the sinner. You're no longer a sinner, it says in Romans 5. You're now someone new, someone different. And we were set free from that dominion, that mastery of sin over us which means we don't have to sin anymore. We've been born again with a new heart, a new spirit. Oh, we're a brand new creation that's made in the likeness of God. That's the new you, in the likeness of God, in holiness and righteousness, says in Ephesians 4.24. And that's not someday in the sweet by and by. Because the apostle John in, in 1 John 4 says that you and I have confidence in the day of judgment. Why? Because as Jesus is, so also are we in this world. You're made new. 
That's changed something inside of you. And not only that, then we've now been joined to the Holy Spirit. You guys are the walking temples of God. Incredible. God's mobile home. Who knew Jesus would trailer trash? But nonetheless, he lives in you and I, and wherever we go, we bring him with us. And now his strength and his power can now be manifested through all of us. And he does all of that in that moment of salvation. Everything's different. You are now finished complete. There's nothing you can add to the finished work of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen? But what James is getting at and what Paul also gets at and what John gets at and what Peter gets at is that that internal change will lead to external change. But note the order. It's not external change will somehow lead to internal change. And that's what both the Protestant and the Catholic view has. That if you can somehow fix your behavior, if you can change the external, then that will wash the inside. That will somehow perfect you on the inside. No, 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 no. Let me say that again. No, 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 no. It starts with the inside of what Jesus has done. That leads to the external change. Now, that doesn't guarantee sinless perfection. Is that true, Will? True. Yeah, you know that. So it doesn't guarantee any kind of sinless perfection, right? We can still be deceived. We can still give in to the flesh and still be used as an instrument of the flesh. But the difference is now we don't have to. We're free now to choose him. And the beauty is even when you give in to that temptation, nothing can remove, remove you from that grace of God. Nothing can disqualify you from that grace of God. Because even in the moments where sin increases, God's grace increases all the more. It's not your job to maintain your relationship with Jesus. You have it. You are his child. So the question then becomes, well, how do we know, how do we recognize this enduring faith, this real faith? How do we know when someone has just offered up a prayer and hasn't really had any kind of transformational change in their heart versus the ones who have? Well, interesting again, the Protestants and Catholics would have the same answer to this. And their answer is, what is their level of obedience to the Ten Commandments? That's where they're coming back to. How much are they are following all the commandments? How often do they go to church? How often do they serve? Or maybe how much do they give? How much do they pray? How much do they read the Bible? And they're going to point to their obedience and the cleanliness, so to speak, of how they live their lives. How clean is their nose, essentially. Which, if you think about it, they would say the goal after salvation is to become more like the Pharisees. Isn't that interesting? that the Pharisees were the people that seemingly were the furthest from Jesus because of their so-called good works, because they so-called clean behavior on the outside, but they couldn't, they weren't the goal. That's not what it was. Thankfully, the apostles were looking for something deeper. And so there's a, a series of verses, and, and we're not going to we're not going to get you to look up them up right now, but maybe you can write them down and look them up later. But the first one is in James chapter 2. It's the, the, the context is the verses before what he said about Abraham in 21. And really the entire chapter, you know, we can go start at 14, but I think you can all go all the way back to one. What is James going after? He's talking to people who are failing to show love and mercy to one another. And that's what he's pointing to. When he's talking about works, he's not talking about obedience to the law. He's talking about where's your love? Where's your care for one another? Because right now you've got people who are hungry, who are struggling, and, and you're all living at home and fat and warm and everything. But other people who you call your brother and your sister, they're struggling and you don't seem to acknowledge or care. You thought it was just enough to pray the prayer and check a box and, and that's it, but you're not willing to love anyone. John had the same thing in 1 John 4, 19 to 21. He says this, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. How can you say, I, I hate the church or I hate Christians, but I love God? Doesn't add up, John's saying. You can't, you can't uh, carelessly and recklessly look at others and their suffering and just keep walking past them and say, praise God. That's not what it's about. 
Or Paul in Galatians 5, 6 says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. And quite frankly, you could put anything in there that the church has argued about. Forms of baptism, types of worship, tithing or not tithing, um, you know, what Bible you read, all kinds of the, the, the silly, foolish, immature things that we argue about as Christians it means nothing. And what matters, Paul says, is neither circumcision or uncircumcision. The only thing that matters, but faith working through love. Faith that will be expressed not by following 10 commandments, he says, but faith that is expressed through loving other people. And that love is much more than just this sentimental, you know, romantic, oh, isn't that nice? I feel good. Love is in action. Love is doing what's in another person's best interest. Love is caring for people. It's laying down your life for other people, it's serving them. Paul also writes in 1 Corinthians 13, that famous passage that typically we only ever hear in weddings, right? But in the first three verses, he says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. It doesn't matter how effective you speak or how beautiful you sing. If you fail to love people, you know what God hears? Gong, gong, gong. That's how I sound singing, right? That's what he's hearing. It's worthless, he's saying. He goes on and he says, if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all the faith so as to move mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. Doesn't matter how smart you are, how much you, how many boxes you can check and how much you've accomplished, if you fail to love one another, it's dead. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. See, a lot of people, what they do is they think if I, okay, I got to serve and I got to love, so I will do it out of obligation. But they don't actually, are not motivated inside in the love. It's pointless. You see, Paul shares in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, it's the love of Christ that compels us. That's why up here we don't give you a list of things to do. You need to make sure you're doing this and doing this and doing this and doing this and go here and do that. We're not trying to give you the rules because you don't follow rules. You don't follow principles. You don't follow uh, standards. You don't follow commandments. Who do we follow? Jesus Christ. And I believe in all my heart that the love of Christ will compel you to love. You see, the reality is the more you know how much he loves you, I defy you to bottle it up. Have you ever seen those, those, um, those geysers that are like this, this, uh, bubbling, you know, fountain? And, and, um, and I've seen people and they, they just got this pool of water and they go, well, I'll just throw some more dirt on it. And, and for a time it looks okay, but, but that bubbling geyser just keeps coming up. And then they throw concrete on top of it, but then it cracks the concrete and it just keeps bubbling up because you can't contain the geyser. Well, you and I can't contain the love of God. It will compel you to love. So it's not a matter of how, how do I check the box to know that I've got that authentic faith. It will naturally happen. And then John, Jesus himself in John chapter 13, he says this, a new commandment I give you that you love one another, even, even as I have loved you, that you will also love one another. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples. By how you love one another. He didn't say they will know you're my disciples because you follow the Ten Commandments. They know you're my disciples because you keep your nose clean and you don't get drunk on Saturday nights. They know that you're my disciples because you give and you tithe and you, you, you understand you know, passages of scripture and you can recite those things and you go to church on Sunday mornings. He said, the world will know that you're my disciple by how you love one another. And I promise you, there is no greater evangelical tool out there than to love people. Because the reality is, how do you say no to that kind of love? It breaks down barriers. It breaks down all kinds of walls and boundaries when you see the love that God has for you and for them. And so that's what James is talking about. When he says it's not enough just to say a sinner's prayer, you need works. The works are what? Love. 
not commandments, love. So what does that look like for you and I today? Well, again, quoting from 1 John chapter 3, Jesus says this, John's quoting him, he says, this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in, and he in, he in him. We know this by that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So the Christian life is simple. It really is simple. We've overcomplicated it when we get into all kinds of some of these details and, and, and we make it more difficult than it needs to be. It's simple. Believe. Believe that Jesus is your savior. Believe that Jesus is the only pathway to, to God himself. And in believing that, now go love one another. Go love as you've been loved. Go share that love with others. That's it. That's the gospel. And now again, now that we're on that team Yahweh, we're on team God, that love will happen. And what we're trying to create now out of that love is a community of grace. It's way better than following the law. Because the reality is the law may look good, but there's no life in the law. The law only results in death because the law is a picture of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and it only results in death. But grace and the spirit and trusting Jesus himself, that's where we find life in him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, uh, we thank you that despite some of the technological fun here, we have something far greater for what you have planned this morning, which is to understand your grace and your love. And so I pray, Lord Jesus, that um, we would all be encouraged, first and foremost, with your love for us. That there's nothing we can do to add to that love. There's nothing we can do to improve our standing with you, that you, are, you just love us. And we get to grow in that love and grow in that confidence, that love. And that will compel us now to go love one another. To love every person in this room and in the church, but even beyond the walls of this church. Whether they agree or disagree with us, whether they have the same political leanings as us, whether they listen to the same music as us, we would just love one another. And that the world would see it and know that we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that message and it blessed you as we discover more about this great life we have in Jesus. I want to encourage you to, to like and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And also you can check out these videos here and watch more sermons and more messages. It really will encourage you in the, the joy and the power we have in Jesus Christ.